All right, so I know that my last video talking about the expense of the EcoBoost didn't quite sit well with some people. Either they didn't quite understand what it was I was making a point of, or they did understand and still had some disagreements with what I said. Now, it's perfectly fine if you disagree. My only problem is, is when people take a different opinion and because they disagree with it, they try to disprove it like it's nonsense. That's where I have a problem. And there wasn't one thing I said in my last video that wasn't true. The EcoBoost engine, the four cylinder specifically, two, three that you find in a Mustang is expensive to build. It really is. If you're trying to build a very competitive car, it is very expensive. Is it impossible? No. Is it expensive? Yes. And that was the whole point of my last video, which didn't seem to mm, come through as direct as I probably should have made it. Sometimes I have a problem with getting my thought out of here, out of here, <laughs> into there, where it's easy to understand. So I, yeah, I apologize, it was a 20 minute video. So first off, I wanna just say, nothing's wrong with the EcoBoost. Yes, it's perfectly fine as it is. It's an economy Mustang, if you will, you know? It's not meant to be the balls to the wall performance car. Does it have potential? Is there a recipe for power? Yes, there is. If you want a powerful EcoBoost, the recipe is out there. But a lot of people were chiming in like, well, no one, no one ever does this to an EcoBoost. I don't know about that because I've been part of the four cylinder EcoBoost community now for a couple years, but I've always hung around closely watching what people did with these cars when they came out in 2015. So these newer cars, when they came out, I was intrigued by them. I wasn't turned off by them. I thought they were a cool option um, for some people. As I've gotten older, as I've learned more about cars, and as I've gotten my own cars and have learned how expensive it is to do stuff to these cars, I realized a lot of things about the EcoBoost platform that I didn't know about before. And I would always go on the forums, I would read all the threads, you know, of course you had half saying one thing, another half saying another, but everyone was always trying to squeeze the last little bit of power out of their Mustang. And I get it, it was what they could afford. And when, when it's the only thing you can afford, you want to get the most. So you always saw threads like, how to get the most power? Should I tune this? Who do I go for that? People were just always going down a rabbit hole with how do I squeeze power out of this car? No matter what, no one was really happy with what they were able to get out of the EcoBoost platform before disaster struck. Really couldn't do that much with them because either you pop the head gasket or you break a rod and send a piston through the side of the block. So up until pretty much recent years, your factory EcoBoost couldn't really handle more than a tune anyway before crap would go south. But it didn't stop people from wanting more out of them. That's what we do. That's our, in our nature as car guys who are looking for performance. Make things better, make things faster. It's what we do. And people are always trying to find new ways to get more power. Over time, people have learned that you can only do so much with a two, three block. People started learning if you you know, started mixing different Ford parts that you could come up with a, you know, a Frankenstein engine that wasn't half bad. Because on one part of the spectrum, where the 2.0 block is superior to the 2.3 block, the 2.3 cylinder head is superior to the 2.0 cylinder head. <laughs> you know, so it's like, well, when you match them two together, you get the best flowing cylinder head and the most strongest bottom end. And that's when people start doing that. And it's kind of the new standard now when it comes to building a nice, EcoBoost engine. I just don't understand why some comments say they never see people trying to build super high horsepower EcoBoost. I see it all the time. I see it in the threads, in the groups, people are asking, do I need this turbo? Do I need that turbo? They're going with the biggest aftermarket turbo that bolts up to these cars, the BNR 600, NX2s, meth, ethanol, E85. Well, there's a lot of people out there trying to push these engines, and I, I use that word very strongly, trying to push these engines. And there's only a handful, at least, you know, that we know of, who have actually achieved a relatively powerful EcoBoost engine. By that, I mean like five, 600 horsepower. And it's really a small amount of people who are doing it. 
there's a lot more who are trying and they just can't. They realize that it's either not worth it and it's too expensive to try to squeeze the power out of these engines because you're pretty much forced to rebuild from day one. You really don't have many options if you want to get something out of it. I'm really not sure where those people who, who, who have said what they said have gotten the information they got, but they must not belong to the EcoBoost Mustang group or just part of any EcoBoost group because for years now, it's been the same story. The, the majority of people are trying to get as much as they can. The minority are the ones that are content with a tune on a stock engine and that's it. That right there, I just wanna go ahead and nip in the bud. So that's out of the way. Secondly to that, I wanna talk about why is the EcoBoost so expensive in the first place? I mean, really, should it be as expensive as it is? currently to build? No, it absolutely should not be. You are dealing with four cylinders. This engine block sitting next to me is literally, I could put it in my lap right now. It is tiny. I should not be spending a premium on something like this. I showed you in my last video, if you want over 800 horsepower out of one of these, it is possible you're spending upwards of 13, $15,000 for that. And no one with a right mind is going to spend $15,000 building a four cylinder Mustang. They're just not. No one's gonna be spending that money on any platform that these engines come in because there's something else out there that is objectively better and can be done for a far less money and a lot easier to, to achieve that kind of performance. This is where I'm gonna muddy the waters a little bit and kind of throw a curveball to this whole discussion. You can agree with it or you don't have to. It probably is a little bit polarizing to think about, but I honestly believe that the reason why the EcoBoost engine is so expensive is directly related to the aftermarket support that we have for the EcoBoost platform. And that's across all EcoBoost engines, not just the four cylinder. Think about it, all of the options we have that make aftermarket parts for these cars, for this engine platform, charge a significant premium. And I understand how and why perhaps they may do that. You know, the supply and demand economics bull crap, I get it. However, I feel like it's having a negative impact on, you know, the community who wants to actually try to do something with these engines because they ha are becoming out of reach or just simply doesn't make sense when someone can just go get a Mustang GT, slap on a supercharger and a tune for eight, nine grand and be happy with a V8, which no one is going to ever turn away. So, you know, example, EMS, and I ain't talking anything bad about EMS and this ain't nothing against them, but the reality is they're charging a lot of money for their services, for their products, to have these engines built, to have them do this, have them do that. And they are marketing themselves as EcoBoost experts. They are the ones with the eight second EcoBoost Mustang. I'll talk more about that in a minute. And you know, they're developing themselves as the go-to source. Like if you wanna build big power EcoBoost, you come to us. We know how to get it done because we've done it. So a lot of people are going to them and they're spending a lot of money, mainly just for a rebuilt bottom end. The people who are actually trusting their advice and going to them because they want something that's got a lot of power, EMS is charging a fortune for four cylinder power. And I know like uh, like the Hondas and stuff, the Honda K-Series and uh, it can get a little pricey, but generally speaking, it's the same kind of song and dance as you have with the uh, Coyote is that the Honda engines are already just well engineered from the factory standpoint. They don't really need much to make power. Basically what you have to do with them is just keep them together. You're only reinforcing factory Honda stuff because most of it works well, the heads flow well, cams flow well. Once again, you just add boost and you have power. You just have to make sure everything's strong and robust to handle that power. Whereas the EcoBoost, you're doing two things. You're making sure everything's strong to handle the power, but you also have to make things flow better because factory EcoBoost parts suck. I use the Coyote as an example for that because you can either get a Coyote Mustang or even get an EcoBoost Mustang. So that's why I, I use the Coyote, but other four cylinder engines out there, the markets, you, you don't have to spend as much even to get the same performance. And that's out of four cylinders. So it's very discouraging for those who kind of, you know, they want to stick with Fords. 
they they're kind of you know into weird things. They want an alternative engine platform, and you know they're looking at EMS like, wow, these guys have an eight second EcoBoost Mustang. That's what I want. I'm gonna go ahead. I'm gonna make my EcoBoost Mustang balls to the wall. Except they're not. They're never going to an EMS. Here's the thing with EMS. There and once again, I ain't talking crap, but this is exactly what is going on. Their their Mustang, EcoBoost Mustang, is 100% race car. You cannot drive that car on the road. But even if it was street legal, no one would take that car on the road for any extended period of time. You just can't. It is set up to go straight and as fast as it can. It is a full-fledged race car. And in fact, I think they've only done like an 8.3, and I know say only. In today's world, 8.3, doesn't seem all that fast now, does it? Because it's so common for cars to get into the eights now. You know, they just switched over to a dry sump oiling system at the cost of three plus thousand dollars on their already just heavily reworked EcoBoost. Their EcoBoost is dry block, filled, sleeved, everything, fully poured ahead, the biggest cams, custom cams you can get for that, special fuels systems. Spe I mean, they, they've gone, they've, they've, they've done every possible thing. I mean, custom turbo, to get the power that they're making out of the car to make it run 8.3. There are fully streetable and drivable Coyote cars running the same number with interior and everything. And the other crappy part about EMS's car, it's not competitive. Every event that they've put that car in could never stay competitive. They might win a few rounds and then either the car goofs which I understand is racing, or they lose, which I also understand is racing, but it's not a super competitive car. Does it run a good number? Yeah, I think it's pretty good. They're the only ones who've done it, right? Once again, it's like, wow, they're running all that. If they can run that with their car, then what can I do with mine? Until you realize that you could never drive that car on the road. There's no cooling system. The amount of work it took to get to that, I mean, it's pretty much a billet block shy of a full blown, race engine that they, they have literally done every possible thing they could just to get to that point where other four cylinder platforms have exceeded that for a long time now. And my point in saying this is, is because companies like EMS are a big drive. They're an influence to the community who wants to build these engines. And it's interesting because people, you know, Jesse, who is the owner of EMS and uh, of the eight second EcoBoost Mustang, he's always brought up in, in arguments about the EcoBoost. Oh, well, Jesse has got an eight second EcoBoost Mustang and he's the only one. And I'm not saying that as a bad thing, but the only reason Jesse is the only one is because he's built a business around it. If his business didn't have nothing to do with that engine, you think he would have an eight second EcoBoost Mustang? Hell no, he would not. But he's developed the business around EcoBoost. So it is great marketing to have the pushing an EcoBoost engine into the eights in an S550 platform. What I think is interesting is all the people, the very few people who actually have these cars that are towards four digit numbers, Jesse, Ryan from B PD Tuning with his Focus RS, and uh, they're the ones I know off the top of my head. I'm sure there's a few other out there, but I know they're only just a small, small, tiny, a little bit of percentage of the, the gross people who mess with these cars. It's funny to think that the very few people who have these really high horsepower EcoBoosts are also the same people who are trying to sell you a product or service that they offer for these pl engine platforms. So, you know, it's like they've kind of catered and created their little niche market. They're capitalizing on it. But because they are kind of owning their own little market, they have pretty much created a price point that doesn't make sense. And I'm sure sooner or later, they're gonna price themselves out of relevance when it comes to these engine platforms as the EcoBoost ages. I know EMS has already pivoted their business to supporting the V6 EcoBoost cars. I think a lot due to that reason. I think they're honestly pricing themselves. I mean, I'm not talking about EMS, I'm talking about every one of these companies that make parts, not just reselling parts, I mean, they're the ones actually making parts for the EcoBoost platform. I think they're pricing themselves out of being relevant because they're not only hurting themselves in the long run, 
by doing so, they're hurting the community that is passionate and wants to do stuff with these engines. They're making them so expensive and unobtainable for the average person, which is what these were supposed to be. These were supposed to be the entry level engine to the Mustang. Now, they're actually pretty expensive to do anything with and most people are just going to go with the Coyote and I don't blame them. I would too at that point. And I think that's a problem that no one really talks about, which means I think us as car enthusiasts, especially in the community of the EcoBoost world, we need to stop. We really need to stop relying on these companies and businesses to do the work for us. We need to go back to the roots of hot riding and doing this crap for ourselves. Whatever happened to the days of pulling an engine out of a car, putting it together and, and going and running a number? Whatever happened to that? You know, what happened to people doing their own work? I understand the, the, the pros and cons of buying um, like a new block versus a used. And there's gonna be a lot of machining involved with the used block. But you know, that also begs the question, how much is it really necessary? And I've been thinking about this a lot lately, like really, to build an EcoBoost engine, does it really take as much as the aftermarket is saying to build a really potent EcoBoost Mustang or EcoBoost engine? Does it, is it really gonna take $13,000? What happened to this being the cheap engine? And I think it's possible to do it for half that. If you're comfortable, if you know how to do some porting and whatnot, like, and you can de-shroud some of the valves and whatnot and clean up some of the ports and the heads, that saves you thousands right there now. Ain't it gonna be no dang five angle CNC thing, but it's certainly gonna be better than stock. We can do this ourselves. This is not unobtainable. Putting the bottom end together. I haven't done it. That's why I chose to pay someone who's done it. You have to learn how to set the thrust on the crank and once again, not a big deal. The dial indicators really aren't all that much. We can take time and learn how to do it. It's not as hard as we make it to be. And I think if we can limit how much dependency we have as community, as DIYers, people who are building our cars in our garages on a budget, if we can limit our dependency on you know, the aftermarket, we can obtain cheap power from this platform where it actually does make sense. I mean, would you consider an EcoBoost engine if you can get 800 horsepower from it, like less than 5,000? At that price point, would you say that's worth it? I think I would. I think if I could build an 800 horsepower EcoBoost for less than 5,000, that's definitely a, uh, a big incentive. But what makes that impossible is the aftermarket. The premium the aftermarket we have for this, this platform makes it uh, impossible. And I think it's pricing a lot of people out of the market. It doesn't make sense. So with that said, I know this video has dragged on longer than I expected, but I had a lot of things I wanted to say and I think you'll appreciate what I have to say. But let me know what you think. Go ahead, throw your thoughts in the comments. So I'm gonna finally wrap it up here for this video. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up. Share with everyone you know if you wanna see more content like this and you haven't already. Go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Keep a lookout for the next Cars Created video.